Uh, folks, today's session will be part uh, presentation and part code demo. Feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point during this session. Uh, with that, let's get started. Today's session is uh, the third part in a series of sessions. The first one spoke about uh, was uh, dig, dug deep into algebraic types and uh, pattern matching. The second session was on monads, and today is the all is on effects. I hope you have gone through uh, the earlier sessions or the recordings. Uh, I'll start with a more theoretical uh, overview uh, today. And I'll talk, we'll start with mathematical definition of uh, relation. A binary relation from one set to another is a subset of the Cartesian product of the two sets. Here's an example, the set of uh, four elements, one, two, five, seven, and there's another set which is of B, C, uh, A, C, M, N. Note that there is no uh, in, uh, outgoing arrow from uh, to M. Here is a more real world example. I have spoken about three people, Naveen, Arvind and Raja. And on the right hand side are the languages they can speak and understand. Naveen can uh, speak three languages, Arvind two and Raja two. So for engineers, uh, a good uh, real world application of relation is in relational algebra used in databases. Functions are a special kind of relation where every element from the first set is mapped to exactly one element in the second set. So this is would be a good example. Naveen's uh, mother tongue is Telugu, Arvind, Kannada, Raja, Tamil, and so on. So functions are relations which have exactly one is to one for every element from the source or the domain set. If we map it to databases, each function can be thought of having one key uh, to the source table and one key to the destination table. In uh, computer science, relations are realized via data as I explained here. But when it comes to functions, every single element of the source type should have an associated entry from the destination set. This is not efficient. Hence, in programming, we realize functions as computations. Going further, the abstraction of sets in mathematical world is mapped to types in the programming world and functions in the mathematical world are realized as computations in the programming world. Any questions so far? No question, please. Thank you. Okay. So folks, here's an example. The string dot length function can be thought of mapping from the type of strings to the type of integers. Similarly, this check if a integer is even or not is a function from the set of from the type of uh, integers to the type of boolean. You see, you can navigate from one type to another type to so on, similar to following foreign keys from one relationship relation to another 
in databases. Now uh, folks, what do you think is a problem with this line of code? Yeah, yes, could be null. So then yes. uh, you will have a problem. Now, in uh, null is considered to be a, a valid assignment to the reference S. But S dot length explodes with a null pointer exception. So null references are considered to be a billion dollar mistake. You can find multiple people talking about it. So this is a nuance in the programming world, which uh, has bitten programmers forever. Now going back, I mentioned that Function is one where every element of the input type is mapped to one element of the output type. If any of these ele elements from the input type are, are, do, are do not have associated element, then such a relation is called partial function. Now let's move to the demo. Are uh, folks my ID visible? Yeah. yeah. OK, for those of you who have uh, been to my sessions, this is uh, a sealed interface. This is a uh, algebraic type with two implementations, one for none and one for sum. So every instance of a type option cannot can can be can uh, can be empty, can be none. Or it can have some value of type E. And I have implemented match uh, pattern matching as well as the map and flat map functions implemented on top of this. To demonstrate this, I have a simple dummy example. There is a type called company, the type called person. So given a person, we can uh, a function returns the company that person is employed in. And given a company, it returns the CTO of that company. Note that all uh, people might not be employed and hence they may not have associated company. And not all companies can have a associate, uh, can have a CTO for them. So, Employer for a person and CTO of a company are partial functions because there can exist persons and companies who do not have associated map. This is a nuance of the programming world, which is typically not there in the function in the mathematical world. So option is an abstraction which uh, encapsulates availability of data in some scenarios and non-availability of data in other scenarios. So let's look at the code for this. So I've taken two people, Naveen and Satya Nadella. And there is a function which finds employer. Employer of a person. 
finds the correspond uh, CTO of that person, finds the name of that CTO, determines the length of that name, and uh, spits it out. So Naveen is currently not employed. He does not have a company. They cannot be a CTO of a non-existent company. They cannot be a name of a non-existent name. I mean, of a person. They cannot be a length of a non-existent string and so on. While Satya Nadella works for Microsoft, Microsoft has a CTO, Kevin Scott. Kevin Scott has I'll just use initials KS here. So going back, if I run this code, you see that when the argument is Naveen for this function, the output is zero. While the argument is Satya Nadella, the output is two. So what was a partial function has now been converted into a function by application of what is called the option effect. Now folks, it's very important that we get this nuance. Let me know if you have any questions. Folks, good time to ask questions. Please don't be shy. There are no bad questions. Yep, we can proceed. Uh, we will then stop you when we have okay. questions. You have been so talking folks, about uh, one to one exactly this slide. Mm -hmm. What about in databases? We have one to many relations. Yeah, so Arvind, functions are special type of relations where there is an additional constraint that every element is mapped to exactly one other element. That is a difference between relations and functions. That is why we implement relations via data and functions as computations in the programming world. Does okay. it make sense? Yeah. So folks, we took a powerful concept from the mathematical world and started programming with it. The programming world and the real world have nuances. An example is one what I just illustrated. It is possible that not every person is employed, not every company has a, a CTO and so on. Without compromising on the beauty and the power of functional programming, we are still working with the nuances of the real world. So effect are a abstraction from the pro functional programming world, which maintain the requirements of the functional programming world without uh, overlooking the nuances of the programming slash real world. One such example is option. So we can categorize functions into two buckets. Option is a container to facilitate uh, optionality. Optionality is a effect and option is a corresponding monad to set to deal with this effect. You see that string length takes a string and returns a integer. 
it is not familiar with the option monad, nor does it have to deal with optionality. Such a function is called pure function. While the function employer is aware that there might be some person who might not have associated company, hence I have to return a option as a return parameter, return type. So these functions are called effectful functions. I repeat, there are types which come from functional programming. There are effects which are there to bridge the gap between the real world and functional world. You have pure functions and you have effectful functions. These uh, set of constructs together allow us to program in a functional programming way without compromising on the nuances of the business world. This is a, uh, a pictorial representation. The type person is a simple type. It does not understand optionality. In our code, we implemented the optional monad, which is generic. The consumer of this can combine these two to provide option of a company. So we take a simple type and find responding effectful type, which could be option of person or option of a company. If we had a pure function, like what we had here, string length and person name, these are pure functions. By utilizing them, we still get back a uh, an option of something. Similarly, we can flat map over these. And this is a effectful function. It, it, it is aware of optionality and hence return a option monad. So this honors the map and flat map semantics which we discussed in my previous presentation while still provides a very concise way to deal with uh, optionality uh, now is a good time for questions if you have any Guess not. So optionality is not the only possible computational effect that we may have to honor. Methods can throw exceptions. Methods can access mutable state. Methods can perform some computation asynchronously. They can access configuration. They can access IO and so on. There are many such effects that are possible. You can think of effects as a super set of side effects. In this talk, I, am, I will focus on some of the effects 
and I will not be speaking about how do you handle side effects. I will spoke about couple of other effects here. Uh, OK, let me try to make this a little more interactive. Folks, if you try to do a get call, HTTP get call, what are the possible scenarios? Uh, REST API call? Yes. To pass parameters, get back response. And yeah, what are the possible there is no scenarios? Valid, yeah, go on. There is no valid response, to get an error code. Uh, the validity can be because of a client side error. Hmm? Or could be from a server side error. OK. Or could be from transportation error. Mm -hmm. Agree? Yep. So if you're trying to make a HTTP a get call, you may get back what you wanted. Or you can get a pause a multiple error. Um, Conditions. Yep. So this example of a particular method call returning types of two, two I mean results of two different types. Does it make sense? Hello. Yeah. Does it make? Does it? Does it make sense? Hello, people. I can yes, hear you. It makes sense. So, yeah, I can hear you too. It makes sense. You can think of this as in having a duality of uh, response types. So, either yep. is an effect which models these kind of scenarios. The result can be of type left okay. or type right. Both of them are uh, parametric in the sense they can take types. Type L or type R. And they basically data types which have either a left or a right. You see left has only the left part. And the right has only the right part. The convention is right. that failure scenarios are mapped to left and success scenarios are mapped to right. right. This simple mechanism allows us to make say HTTP call. Get back the R will have the entity which you're interested in. The left will have the response code. You can map over the right. Saying, oh, I got an entity, let me process that. But if that call had originally failed, you will still have an either where you process if and only if the, the instance what you had had a valid entity. This honors the same paradigm we spoke about here. You can have pure functions which work on the entity, or you can have effortful functions which may give you partial data. This is the next effect I wanted to talk to you about. Questions, comments? So either or is the way either uh, is the way to handle exceptions. That's what you're saying. Or more than exceptions. Left and right. Yes. Okay. So okay, thanks. Try is a similar concept where the left is equivalent to an exception. So you can map over a try. Where it will process only the sum part if it was present. And it will ignore the. Uh, the exceptions. 
So either and try are mechanisms to deal with exceptions or possible errors. The two different effects to handle similar problems. Yeah. Okay. Uh, folks, now I'll we'll talk about asynchronous computations. So you in programming, you have activities which do not respond synchronously. Now, when the asynchronous task responds, we need code to uh, deal with that and process the data which is available then. This is uh, modeled as the task effect. When so given a task, we know what the task is supposed to return type E. So we have a map function which takes that that particular uh, task and computes a new task and returns a new task. So even before the first task is completed, we can get a new task. This is similar to the concept of promises and futures. So here is another effect to model these kind of computations. So here's a simple code to test this. There is a task which will run hello world, but eventually. For this task, we run, we map a pure function string dot length and check if it is uh, even or not. By the time the uh, statement on line 11 is executed, the hello world is yet to be computed. Only on line 13 will the computation of hello world actually happen. So let's see what happens if you run this code. You see the the abode to execute task was printed first. Followed by the true statement. So. Without running anything. We create a chain of tasks. And only subsequently are the tasks executed. Now underneath the hoods, I use I think uh, I use an executor to run these tasks. Now you can have task A depending upon task B and so on, and you can have a DAG of tasks. We can have a monad implementation which manages a thread pool and figures out what tasks can be run parallelly by assigning them to different threads and figure out the optimal way of running these set of tasks. So the task effect slash monad is used for uh, defining a pipeline of tasks and executing them. Task is another of the effects which can be modeled during the uh, using the functional and slash algebraic way of modeling. Open for questions. Oh, here the test task does not take any input. Is that still fine? 
our functional programming. Sir, can you please repeat that? The function here you have test task, mm -hmm. not passing any input. Is that acceptable in functional programming? Line number nine, it doesn't take any argument. No, line number nine is a J unit test case, test engine test case. Okay, test case, right? fine. To demonstrate and, uh, this. Yeah. Okay, the task is a type for lazy evaluation. Is that understanding correct? Asynchronous computation would be a better word. Yeah. Would be a better word. Okay, asynchronous yeah, okay. computation. Both are yes. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yep, let's proceed. People will ask question in the last slide. So, folks, in my previous talk, I spoke about lists and sets, which have the map uh, function and flat map function. You can have a function which takes uh, and returns, uh, which returns a list or a set. Or you can have functions which is returned from E to F. This is a state diagram, or this is a diagram which illustrates monads. The same concepts were used here. So things like tasks and option, either task, either option or monads which follow this kind of a contract. So you can think of both list sets, option, task, either, try, state, all of these constructs have pretty much the same signature. It's a fairly compact concept which can be used to model a wide range of uh, abstractions. This is something I wanted to highlight. Yeah, I want to repeat. There are pure functions like string length. There are effectful functions like uh, uh, the find employer and find CTO. And you have effect containers like option, try either and task. I'm done with my presentation. I'm uh, open to answer any questions if you might have. Some people, questions from your side? One question I have, this is Girish here. Um, on the um, task thing that was just uh, demonstrated, when exactly did the task get executed. So when we said the last line, uh, the true on is line 13, the... you're invoking the execute method on the task. So a, a good metaphor from the real world is the maps and flat maps are used to compose a recipe or create a recipe. How to cook, do this, then do that, get this, clean that. All of this together constitute the recipe. At the runtime, you are defining the recipe. Till line 11, you are only composing the recipe. On line 13, you are executing the recipe. That is a metaphor. OK, I think I understood. Now you can have different executions. You can have single threaded execution, you can have multi threaded executions, you can have intelligent execution or small and dumb execution. So this kind of mathematical way of composing constructs gives you vistas to optimize this. Okay, Ramnathan, you had some question. Yeah. 
Karamadhan, you raise your hand. Uh, focus on responding. If anybody else has questions, I'm happy to answer. Excuse me, Navi. Yes, this is that. I uh, I joined the session a bit late, but I had one small uh, query. It's it related to earlier session also, I guess in a way. But uh, for asynchronous computation and mm -hmm. lazy evaluation, like what is the difference? Because uh, I notice you use the terms. Uh, mm, differently right like in some scenarios you would rather use the first word than using okay okay, okay. great question Alata. now if you go back to here on line 10 the computations can start but they might not return Uh, OK. That is flavor one. Flavor two is. Nothing is have nothing is being computed on line 10. Correct. So. If this were to have a system dot print ln here. That. Uh, printing will happen only uh, after this. When we say after this, uh, do we mean after when the we execute the exe when we launch the execute command? Only then something will happen. OK. So if you go to Starbucks, place an order for your coffee. They will give you your name or some handle. You start waiting. But uh, something is happening immediately. As soon as the billing is completed, somebody starts working in the background. That is, you can think of one step asynchronicity. What we have is a two step asynchronicity. Only uh, to draw a parallel, only upon launching the execute method, will the coffee's preparation start. This is a difference between the promise model and the task model. To be more precise. Okay. Let me know if that was clear. Uh, yeah, I was just. Uh, yeah, in a way, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, what is the effect and side effect? How are you differentiating them? OK. Side effect is writing to writing to or reading from any mutable state. For mm -hmm. example. A pure a functions read the input. For the same input, they're supposed to generate the same output. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So one of the requirements of function is they return the same output, the same input. This is not true. If you have, this might not be true if your function accesses some mutable state. Yeah. 
so side effects are effects where they're talking about accessing mutable state okay there are monads which are there to deal with these kind of side effects which i might do in a subsequent talk but you can think of side effects as a subclass or a subset of effects okay uh, so the effects are the ones which uh, deal with immutable state side effects are the ones which deal with mutable state so start of our understanding okay that's a slightly uh, as i wouldn't say that effects are computational effects which are visible to consumers of functions for example the employer function returns option company option is an effect this is part of the employer's contract the employer methods contract so optionality is now externally visible the same is true okay. if you were to use try the same is true if you were to use either the same is true if you were to use task now option more abstracts optionality try abstracts exceptions either abstracts this or that task abstracts lazy computations but there are other pro other problems in the real world like how do you uh, what should you do to access some database some mutable state so option try either task state writer logger all of these are effects while uh, state writer and reader are effects which deal with side effects Okay. So side Understood. effects are effects. Understood. Yeah. One last question from my side. Uh, you spoke about tasks in the context mm -hmm. of Java. Task is available outside Java as well. The lazy evaluation I'm, uh, I'm talking about. Yeah. Look, all of this is code I have implemented. Okay. It's this available is... in Scala as well, is it? I I program it in Scala. Task is available in Scala as well. Look, algebraic types have been there in Scala for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, my knowledge of Scala is limited on this front. I am not sure whether task is part of Scala, but you can okay. always build task into a Scala library. The way I have done it with Java. Okay, I'll I'll explore mm -hmm. that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the answers. Uh, others, if you have questions, please. Okay, uh, there are no questions. Uh, good. Uh, uh, Naveen has done two more. Uh, two other videos, uh, two other sessions for us. So along with this, this is the third session. Already the recording of the two sessions are available in the Devopedia YouTube channel. This one will also go into the YouTube video channel. Devopedia channel, please feel free to go there and uh, uh, you know refer the videos for all your friends. Apart from this, uh, there is a functional programming 101 video also is available in Devopedia. So if anybody who is new to functional programming would want to know the basics, uh, functional programming 101 is available. Three videos from uh, Naveen is also available in the Devopedia channel, YouTube channel. I, I'm assuming all of you have 
access this uh, please refer to your friends and uh, let them benefit uh, so if there are no other questions uh, thanks navin it was nicely paced all questions got nicely answered uh, thanks for the sessions navin thank you yeah, navin i i see i see one question coming right now lata is wants to ask yeah lata please go ahead sorry i had a question it's a general question related to functional programming mm -hmm. uh, like what would you uh, say are the prerequisites uh, to get into functional programming i'm asking this coming from someone who is uh, picking up a language like python and i'm new to software programming basically Yep, Naveen, you can go ahead and then I'll fill in. So, Lata, on my LinkedIn profile, you will find a slide deck where it's a slide deck to a workshop I conduct. Mm. Okay. It is in Java, but one of the prerequisites I would say is you need to have a handle on generics. So option is a generic. Try was a generic. Task was a generic. To understand uh, higher order types or higher kind of types, it makes sense in, uh, to have a handle on generics. Once you get comfortable with this concept of generics, I think that a slide deck of mine could be used as a self help uh, i mean do it at your own pace workshop to summarize okay. please be comfortable with generix then you can uh, start exploring functional programming concepts yeah and okay. lata there is a video in uh, devopedia channel functional programming 101 that also mm. will explain you what are the uh, uh, advantages you get by coding functional way uh, it is done in scala but uh, not any uh, different from python python is not a functional programming language though functional programming is possible scala java haskell is all uh, scala and java happen you know we can code both functional and non functional there are dedicated functional programming languages also so you can go through all this but uh, mm -hmm. if you go through the 101 video you will get an idea what functional programming is all about sure thank you uh, for the references uh, i will uh, refer to that uh, thank you navin and uh, uh, yeah. i got ramanathan thank you yeah not at all you're welcome yeah. so uh,